Greetings, cinephiles. I'm Kat Liddell. And I'm Bev Jude. And welcome to Wild Rivers Film Radio, the official podcast of the Wild Rivers Film Festival on KCIW 100.7 FM. Today, uh, we're going to be sitting down with Mike Vest. Mike Vest is a longtime local of the Brookings Harbor area, and uh, prior to coming to Brookings, Mike Vest uh, spent some time down in California working on such films as uh, An American Tale, as well as uh, The Secret of Nim. We're going to be talking to him more about his experiences in the film industry, um, as well as a film appreciation class that he's been taking this spring through Southwestern Oregon Community College. And we're just going to sit down and have a nice chat with him. And uh, we'll also later on be having a review of the movie Art Thief from our executive director, Dan Springen. He's going to be uh, talking about that film, which screened recently at the Redwood Theater on May 27th. And it's going to be screening later on at the festival this August. Uh, But before we get started, I'd like to thank the Wild Rivers Film Festival's presenting sponsor for 2024, KDRV Newswatch 12 out of Medford, Oregon. Thank you, Newswatch 12, for making the film festival possible this year. This year's Wild Rivers Film Festival is also brought to you in part by the Oregon Community Foundation, the Ford Family Foundation, Travel Curry Coast, the Roundhouse Foundation, and the City of Brookings. Are you interested in sponsoring the Wild Rivers Film Festival and our mission to celebrate indie cinema on the Wild Rivers Coast? You can learn more on our website, wildriversfilmfestival.com. Now, Bev, what is something coming up with the festival that you're most excited about before we really dig into everything? I mean, we're coming up in August, and uh, what, what, what's, what are you looking forward to um, that's going to be going to be fresh and new this year for the festival in August? Uh, fresh and new, I'm looking forward to the school for young people, that's going to be very exciting. Um, I'm also looking forward to seeing some of the films. Um, similar to what we saw last year, there was a lot of wonderful films, a big variety. And my grandkids are sure excited to go again mm-hmm. this year. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're going to be screening even more films this year than we had. We had four dozen films last year. We're going to have even more this year. So we're really looking forward to just bringing more content and having Having a wider selection, just more cinema for everybody, absolutely. And uh, can you uh, tell me a little bit more about um, what's this, this film school that you're talking about for that's going to be a fresh opportunity for youngsters in the area? Uh, Well, it's it's going to be a week-long school. It's going to be open to young people. They'll be able to meet with professionals. They'll learn all about making a film right from the very beginning, dealing with a screenplay. Uh, all the way through editing, adding sound, picking a site for where they're going to do their filming. And in this case, they'll actually produce a a short film, and we'll show that at the festival. So help to generate a lot of interest in that. Yeah, yeah. So they're going to be learning all that pre-production process stuff. And then uh, that sounds like the last few days of the workshop itself, they're actually going to be filming on location. So yeah, and then everyone will get to see, uh, see the fruits of their labor. So that's a really exciting thing that we're uh, we're looking forward to bringing to the community this year. And hey, if this is the first that you're hearing about the Wild Rivers Film Festival, uh, we're so glad you're joining us. So the Film Festival is a celebration of indie and local cinema that happens during the third week of every August in Brookings. And over the course of four days, we screen more than four dozen films at three locations across the city. And uh, many of our film screenings feature Q&A sessions from visiting filmmakers at the end of the show. And our festival also includes daily educational panels, as well as some VIP parties and a not-to-be-missed awards ceremony on the final day of the festival. And festival passes are on sale now. You can get them at wildriversfilmfestival.com. Man, we cannot wait to see you at the show. Hey, if you're just joining us, you're listening to Wild Rivers Film Radio. I'm Kat Liddell. And today we're sitting down with Mr. Mike Vest. Mike Vest is a longtime resident of the Brookings Harbor area. And before he came our way up the Oregon coast, uh, he actually had some experience in the film industry working on such films as An American Tale, as well as The Secret of Nim. And uh, we're going to talk about also some some things that he's doing right now, including uh, being a part of a new class through Southwestern Oregon Community College about um, classic movie film appreciation. Mike, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me here. It's uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to speak with you once again, Kat. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like we go back, we go back a number of years. Like, yeah, uh, we, we've yeah. done a play or two. Mm-hmm. And yeah, we've been around. But, uh, mm-hmm, yeah. Always a pleasure seeing you. You're, you're a seasoned <laughs> actor, you're a seasoned director, and and I got the uh, the joy of learning 
I think just a few years ago now when we were we were having some conversations during the the COVID pandemic that you actually had a background in anim- animation as well, at least for a little while in the 80s there. Uh, yeah. you, you got to work on some animated films. Yeah, that was a that was a lot of fun. Uh, uh, back uh, when, uh, oh, I was uh, I would say I have to say I was probably in my early thirties. I was living in Los Angeles, and um, I accepted a job with a small little animation studio, and uh, that small animation studio, Fred Craig Productions, merged with uh, another. Um, animation studio uh, Don Bluth Productions and uh, together we worked on uh, the movie The Secret of Nim and um, I was a Xerox camera operator there and that was long before digital or anything actually these movies were actually shot on like 35 millimeter film and uh, this uh, the animation was done on paper and then transferred onto a clear cell <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, uh, my department was we would take the uh, uh, animated drawing, reproduce it onto the clear cell, which later went on to the ink and paint department and then to uh, camera and then to editing. And so it was a process. And we, uh, I would do an average of uh, on an eight hour day, maybe do five seconds of animated film. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was, it was that time consuming. And uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, uh, we we did Secret of Nim, and then uh, later on, uh, Don Bluth got a contract with Steven Spielberg to do An American Tale. And the next thing I knew, wow, I'm working with Steven Spielberg on An American Tale. Never once met the guy or saw the guy. But <laughs> I was I was in this tiny little cubicle taking pictures, basically, because I can't even draw a straight line. But uh, I was I was okay as a camera operator, so that's that was my uh, business there. But uh, since then, uh, I've always have had a, a just a great love of film and the process, particularly animation. Um, a real horror movie uh, trivia buff, I can tell you all the <laughs> who played the wolf man and all these kind uh, uh, uh worthless trivia that but uh, you know <laughs> it, it's fun and uh but uh but what i'm really excited and what i'd like to talk about is the uh, class that they're offering at uh, at, at Shrock right now um yeah it's uh, called classic movie matinee film appreciation it's a course taught by stacy uh, bergstead and we're just learning all sorts of great things about classic old films. Uh, we started the first one we watched was uh, the uh, the Lodger, an Alfred Hitchcock film, and then uh, um, and it was a silent film. I had never seen it, and it was just uh, fascinating from beginning to end. You you could you could see how. Uh, his early works, how that had worked up into his style and technique that he's so famous for now. And then the second one was All Quiet on the Western Front. And what's really fun is before the uh, film begins, we're, we're given a sort of a questionnaire that we answer. Um, typically, it's like what year the film was made and who the actors were the directors and the studios involved, the basic plots, things of that stuff, and always a fun bonus question. And uh, uh, just like a regular movie, we we have some popcorn and, and water and soda just going. And uh, But it, it's fun, and uh, before you know it, uh, the class is just, boom, over like that. The two and a half hours or whatever we're spending watching a film has just flown by. And uh, so learning a great deal there, being able to watch a bunch of old movies uh one of my favorites is sunset boulevard that's going to be coming up here in a, in a few weeks and i'm um, looking forward to that and so it's it's just great and it's, it's giving me more knowledge of the film industry itself yeah i noticed here you uh you very um hopefully provided me with a nice little sheet of all the all the films that you're you're going to be uh watching throughout the course of this class and um, I had no idea that that Hitchcock had been working in uh, film as early as the 1920s. And that's just really incredible to think about. He actually got his uh, experience and training in uh, Germany. And uh, was uh, uh, Fritz Lang was real influential in uh, a lot of his stuff, too. 
with shadows and real sharp angles in the sets and things mm-hmm. of that sort. Mm-hmm. I know, like, well, of course, uh, I mean, a very few people aren't familiar with, uh, are familiar with uh, Psycho. That's that's mm-hmm. one of those m- best well, well-known ones, of right. course, but um, anything to do with, like, you know, like Vertigo, anything like mm-hmm. that. And, like, the birds, of course, you oh, know, sure. like all the classics, but, like, even the 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 silent film and uh you know like it how much how important it is that that visual right. comes through in telling that story as well so he was getting a start with that and playing with those elements mm-hmm. he, and even in his even, very yeah. in even in his very first film and it's continued ever since you always have to look for Alfred Hitchcock in a cameo in one of his movies mm-hmm. what was his cameo in the lodger he he was a mm-hmm. reporter Okay. And all you saw was the back of his head. I <laughs> love it. I'm going to be grilling you on your on your film knowledge throughout the, <laughs> throughout this process, of course, of course. And it looks like um, this classic film, because um, it, it is um, probably going to be an ongoing debate for as long as like film history continues. Like, w- at what point do you cut off and say like this is a classic film? Exactly. And when when does a film become a classic? Uh huh. I don't know if you've had any conversations about that in your class. But like, we, what? Yeah. Um, we refer, or I will refer to a book uh, that was uh, printed here some years back. I, it's from a TM, a TCM, and it's called The Essentials, and it will list what makes uh, a movie an essential movie or what's considered a classic. And um, most of it is just uh, how well it holds up through time, how watchable it is today, and if people... In 2024, think, wow, that's a fantastic film. And it was made, what, 80 years ago? Okay, yeah, that that's what makes it classic, in my opinion. But who am I? And in turn, a classic movie's opinion, it sounds like as well. So, yeah, no, that's um, that's a really good way of, of looking at like what makes a classic film a classic right. film for anybody who's, who's wondering, like if they if they want to go back and look at and get an education and like what the classic films are, you know. Um, a place like Turner Classic Movies may be a good place for them to start if they're not sure where to start. Absolutely. On my own, um, besides taking this class, I've uh, just sort of have made it a hobby to try to watch every uh, Best Picture Oscar winning film since the beginning. Um, it started in 1928, 29 with Wings. Um, I've uh, I've gotten up to... Uh, Oh, let's see. When I go home tonight, I'm going to watch Ordinary People from 1981. Um, and uh, uh, one of the things that I found with these early, early films, and it was disturbing and cringeworthy and just made me go, oh, is just sort of the open, accepted racism in mm. some of these early movies. Um, yeah, it's a it Grand start. Hotel mm. and... Uh, Oh, oh, things that just kind of make it go. But it was just the accepted norm back then. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, You're looking at something yeah, as a snapshot of history yeah, at that point. Yeah, and it just goes to show, man, uh, history was ugly sometimes, even in the innocence of these movies. But uh, but other movies have been great fun as well. It happened one night. We watched that in class here just uh, this past Thursday. And... Uh, that was fun, and that's a and, Clark uh, Gable film, correct? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, what was your experience like watching that? Oh well, yeah. the, I well, see, I cheated before I had taken the class. I had already seen that movie. Oh, I see. So I walked in already <laughs> knowing that I was <laughs> going to be seeing a good one. You need spoilers. And, uh, uh, it, it, it's it's just great fun. There's some great scenes in there. Um, um, the the hitchhiking scene when uh, Claudette Colbert just. Uh, Extends her leg out and the cars stop immediately. That's just classic fun comedy. Mm-hmm. And I was going to say, like, like things like that, having a scene like that in a film, like when you're asking what makes a classic film a classic film, if that gets riffed on in cartoons and films mm-hmm. going forward and exactly. people don't even know where it came from, <laughs> <laughs> then you might have a classic movie on your hands. Yeah, exactly right. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, my goodness. Well, wonderful. Is there a film on this list in your class that you're looking forward to, like more than than any other, like one that you haven't seen that you're really looking forward to experiencing? Um, what's the list again? Oh yeah, here's your here's <laughs> yeah. your list, Betty. <laughs> Thank you very yes, much. Uh, let's you don't see. Which ones the that I head. haven't seen? Okay, well, like next week we're going to watch Stagecoach. Never seen that one. Looking forward to that. That's a John Wayne movie. Uh, Shadow of a Doubt, uh, Hitch, another Hitchcock film. Looking forward to that. 
gas slide I've never seen. Really? Oh, uh, no. Yeah. Oh, there's, yeah. Uh, uh, so as far as the ones I haven't seen, yeah, that that would be it there. Uh, the, the one that's on the list here that I have and own and will watch month or I mean yearly just because I like it so much is Sunset Boulevard. Yeah, the, and uh, extra points if anybody here can uh, tell me what uh, famous line there that uh, Norma Desmond uh, says at the very end of the film. You'll have to tell us. No idea? No, no idea? Mm-hmm. Tell oh, us, Professor. You newbies. Mm-hmm. I'm ready for my close-up now, Mr. DeMille. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I love it. Now I know. I'm going to have to give that one a watch myself. <laughs> you should. It's very fun from beginning to end. Well, uh, this is a new class offered with Southwestern Oregon Community College, and it sounds like um, there's uh, you're in that class with probably about a half dozen other folks. Mm-hmm. And yeah. uh, and what's it been like going through and experiencing this with uh, with a group of people? Well, it, it's right? fun to laugh together, and uh, um, a lot of a lot of interesting comments made. Uh, things like, "Wow, d- look at the style of that car." Yeah, uh, just <laughs> things were so different back then, and and yeah, because it's like 1932. And uh, what's uh, what's really fun about this class is that uh, the Wild Rivers Film Festival uh, is offering a buy one uh, get one free offer for for a ticket goer. So. And if you guys want to go to a movie with me, I got an extra pass. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I love it. Yeah, you get uh, you you. Um, it was very very important to us when we uh, when we were working with SWAC and like trying to trying to get a, a class off the ground that we did we had something that would encourage if people enjoyed taking the class like you know getting the most out of out of their their film education. We're going to see like well what what is what is modern indie cinema look like today like you know. Use your use any skills that you pick up as you're like watching and appreciating these films, and you're thinking about what makes a film a good film. You can come in. We do our audience choice awards and stuff. You know, uh, you can go in okay. like you know, Very lend good. your your critical eye as you're voting on those. <laughs> yeah, uh-huh. going kind of like no, but I know this. Okay, well, this maybe not so much film. critical, but a watchful. <laughs> yes, yes, and or an admiring eye. Or you can just be a more appreciative audience member. Yes, yes. Uh-huh. absolutely. Well, as you're going through all of these uh, these classic films, um, is there, you know, you, it looks like you're working your way into the late 30s at this point. And the uh, list of films runs the gamut from uh, 1926 all the way up to African Queen in 1951. So about a 25 year period there. Um, and is there is there a decade or, or an era that you're most looking forward to? As far as seeing like how how stories were captured like at that time post World War within the mm-hmm. class or my own individual kind of yeah thing, um so. I would say you've been working through all these best pictures yeah um going all the way up to 1981 based on your experience of of going through year by year and watching these in chronological order like what's been your favorite era to sit through oh uh, my um I really enjoyed uh, the the 1960s as far as uh, the the films I watched. You know, at home, uh, a lot of musicals uh, at that time, uh, like from uh, oh, what was 1962, it started with West Side Story, and then two, three years later was My Fair Lady, and then right after that, the next year was The Sound of Music, and uh, then Oliver, and so like a lot of musicals and a lot of long films too. Some of these uh, went uh, three hours long on these musicals. And, uh, but they put an intermission so you can, you know, right. go to the snack. <laughs> so you can go to the snack bar, or mm-hmm. in my case, you know, go to the kitchen and reach into the refrigerator and find a snack for the second half. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, we were talking about that a little bit uh, before before recording got underway. A lot of these films um, on the class list, the run times. I mean, they're none of them are coming in at even two hours long. Right. Like the average for them is around like 90 to 100 minutes. Yeah, that's all and they can really do because the class starts at two. And uh, yeah, when any film's longer, you're going to be going, getting out of there like at five, five thirty. <laughs> yeah, right. So no, no, uh, yeah. Ten Commandments isn't on this no, list. No, no. <laughs> yeah, you're not going to be watching that, that's for sure. Not, not right. Exactly. But, you know, talking about those ones where like intermission started getting into play, with the films and stuff, it's like, you know, films these days are running, running, you know, it's it's normal for them to run two hours or more. And it's like, how do you think, do you think that's that, do you think that is to our benefit or is that a detriment, I think, in storytelling these days? I, 
I'd like a story basically to, to come in by under two hours <laughs> myself. Yeah. <laughs> Just mm -hmm. maybe it's a little bit of my own ADHA or AD <laughs> or vitamin D or whatever. Right, yeah. <laughs> Lack of, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, it's a, a long, long, long uh, movie. Is that? <laughs> <laughs> Stories are getting long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And it does make you wonder. It's like how um, the efficiency of storytelling, yeah. you know. Well, like when I watched Lawrence of Arabia, I said, wow, how, how many hours of thousands of guys r running around in the middle of the desert? I'm starting to get thirsty here. Yeah, I could well, really yeah. use a, use an intermission there. Yeah, yeah. So you can count the both of us solidly in the camp of people who are like, yeah. bring back the intermission. Yeah. The, uh, the, uh, the, uh, yeah. <laughs> only the, like with the musicals when they had an intermission, it, I think having done My Fair Lady and, uh, well, that's about it. Um, that the, the intermissions in the, in the, in the films were about the same time that were in the actual uh, stage musical. Yeah, so. in the stage musical yeah. when, when folks were seeing it live yeah. on Broadway. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah, yeah. Which makes all the sense in the world, LA, of course. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so you could either go to the play My Fair Lady or watch the movie My Fair Lady. And when she sings, uh, she could have danced all night. You know, okay, there's an intermission coming up right after this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can go to the refrigerator. <laughs> or the refrigerator. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or the concession stand. Absolutely. If you're at a revival theater mm -hmm, somewhere. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I, I didn't realize you were such a fan of musicals, Mike. Although, I mean, you know, that's, I guess, not too too big of a surprise. Oh, come on now. You love who here. you're talking here. I know, How many yes. musicals have we done together? Oh, I know. I yeah. know. Yes. Yeah. Too you need to count. Oh, yeah. I've got to say my personal favorite, which is another, um, you know, musical adaptation like mr uh you you've been in the the musical little shop of horrors twice yeah. and uh, i think you should should tell us a little <laughs> oh, bit i thought i thought you're gonna talk about uh, mm -hmm. uh rented christmas oh man now we could uh we could spend all day talking about rented christmas oh, but boy. i think i think for for the film history of yeah the film, like this, little shop this, of horrors this, this, yeah 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 mm -hmm. that uh, uh if the play could be half as good as the movie man i would Happy. Yeah. Oh, the, are you talking about the Rick Moranis movie or the the uh, black and white film that all of that was based on? <laughs> oh, the, the yeah. Um, you know, actually, I have I haven't yet to see the original Little Shop of Horrors. I'll watch it with you one of these days. Yeah, Did you know Jack Nicholson was in it? Let's yeah, let's get together here. You know, throw the old uh, DVD in there and, mm -hmm. and have a laugh or two. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 But yeah. as far as the musical, no, the the Rick Moranis one is just awesome. Oh, it's so great. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but our little stage productions were, Rolf, were fun too, time. right? And, yes, and, and their own little low budget. Mm -hmm. community <laughs> well, and for those who don't know, you had the uh, you had the fun of playing uh, back in the day. You you played uh, Seymour, and then you followed up in a later production as uh, as Mr. Mushnick. So. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was it's sort of a, a twenty time. year thing there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I'll just do this play every twenty years and. Change the characters. Yeah, we'll we'll have a cameo in the next time that we do. This. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I'll be a plant. <laughs> <laughs> Don't feed the plants. <laughs> yeah. Well, wonderful. Like oh. this, uh, is there anything like you want to say about uh, more to say about your oh, experience I think with I've this class? On way more than I should <laughs> well, already. Right. Well, Mike, but thank you for having me. Yeah, here. thank you so much for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. <laughs> Likewise. All right. If you're just joining us, you've been listening to Wild Rivers Film Radio. I'm Kat Liddell. And now it's time for a film review from festival director Dan Springen. Today, Dan is going to be reviewing the film Art Thief, which recently screened at a pre-screening event on May 27th at the Redwood Theater and is going to be screening at the Wild Rivers Film Festival later this August. Thank you, ladies, and I'd like to say hi. I'm Dan Springen. I'm the executive director of the wild rivers film festival today i would like to talk to you about a film called art thief it's rocking it's so cool i'm very 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 happy to have found it and have it in our repertoire it's made for under a million dollars it's a total indie film and Arthur, the director, did a fantastic job putting the right people together, but not only putting the right people together, but putting the right items together. 
he was able to bring his own art gallery, which he runs an art gallery, and he's also an artist. This is another like kind of insider thing. There's a lot of paintings that are in the film that he actually did. The director of the movie is an artist, not just an artist cinema wise, but he's an artist from the ground up. He's a painter. And his work is amazing, and you'll see it in the film. Another thing is he put together an, an amazing cast. They were shooting during COVID and got all these great actors and actresses together. Jacqueline Emerson, Max Deacon, the, these, the, they're the stars in the show. And, uh, and one of my favorite characters is Chris Lazaro, and he plays Bobby the Rat. So you're going to meet him in the movie as well. And there's just something to be said about getting the right cast together. This film has legs. When we showed it at the Orlando Film Festival, we had almost a sold out show for opening night. I took it to Cineworld. And then I took it to uh, the Sarasota Film Festival where it sold out three of its shows. They weren't even supposed to play three. They were only supposed uh, supposed to uh, play two shows. And they gave them a third spot because so many people wanted to see the film. Now, here's my take on why people want to see this film and why they tell friends to see it after they've seen it is because, number one, it's based on true events, right? So this is something that actually happened. And when people get in an audience and they have the ability to talk with the filmmakers about something that really happened, it sparks something. And I've seen it happen at three different film festivals, and that's why I'm thrilled, thrilled, thrilled to bring this particular film to the Wild Rivers Film Festival in August. People are talking about it in all the festival circuits. You're not going to be disappointed. It's a great film. And because Brookings is such an artistic community, I felt that this was a perfect fit. So I hope you guys enjoy the film. Back to you, Kat. Thank you guys for doing a great job. And uh, Bev, I, w- I wanted to ask you as we're as we're wrapping up this this episode, um, you know, can you tell us a little bit more um, if they want to learn more about the festival, uh, where they can find more information about that, how they can connect with us? Uh, they can go on WildRiversFilmFestival.com. All right. Yep. And they can also connect with the Wild Rivers Film Festival on Facebook and Instagram. And uh, you know what? That's it. That's it for this episode of Wild Rivers Film Radio. Uh, If you want to learn more about the Wild Rivers Film Festival, buy passes, volunteer for us, or even sign up to sponsor this uh, this lovely festival that we're building, you can learn more and get connected at wildriversfilmfestival.com. Again, we're available on Facebook and Instagram. Thank you so much for joining us. And hey, we'll see you next time. 